And if you can. Well, let me introduce who's up here. Um, at the far end there, uh, Dr. Arne Carlson. Arne Carlson is the director of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. Uh, he's an adult educator. Um, among others, he has worked with prisoners, with refugees, with unemployed, with people excluded from the system who have been given a second chance. Um, Sir Fazl Hassan Abed, who was the winner of last year's prestigious um, WISE Award, he has set up a remarkable chain of schools in Bangladesh and is now um, uh, setting them up in East Africa. 750,000 children enrolled in 25,000 BRAC schools. 70% of the children are girls. Um, it was the wise prize, I think, that brought many uh, to the full understanding of what he's achieved. I have no doubt the Nobel Peace Prize is somewhere in the... Uh, in the offing, frankly. Somebody out there nominate him. Um, and then uh, Dr. Monique Canto Sperber, she is the president of the Research University Paris, having brought together 17 of the most prestigious institutions in Paris. Uh, she's a philosopher, she's written on ethics and on contemporary moral issues. And finally, not least, uh, Ponce Ernest Saniego. He is what WISE is all about. He is a young wise learner of 2011, a young social entrepreneur from the Philippines, co-founder and chief executive of Outliers. He worked on innovative projects with uh, the Asian Development Bank, Starbucks, uh, and others, and uh, he's just completed a degree uh, in business administration. So that's our, that's our team. And the first question I think that we really want to resolve in educating for our times, and as I say, um, Andrea Schleicher's uh, presentation will weave into much of what we want to discuss, um, is what is learning actually for? What is it for, um, Arne? Learning is for empowering the individuals, people, to live and to work in society. In uh, UNESCO already, in the 1990s, we had a big work, a commission commissioned by UNESCO, the Jacques Delors report, Learning the Treasure Within, that operates with four pillars of learning. Learning is about learning to be, is the first pillar. Learning to be a person. Learning for personal fulfillment, the joy of learning, fulfilling your full human potential. The second pillar is learning to know, learning to learn, learning to get knowledge. And the third pillar is learning to do, meaning learning to act, to handle situations, to take actions, to increase your employability, to be able to work. And the fourth pillar is learning is about learning to live together because we live together, and today we live together in relation also to a global citizenship. So what is learning about? I would say in UNESCO today, we are trying to update, to have a critical revision of the four pillars, what is learning about? And I can give a first proposal, which is to look at the relationship between schools and enterprises or formal education and workplaces. They Rather serve. nicely uh, brought out by that film that we saw yes. ahead of these proceedings. We can see there's much more focus today on also learning how to use what you learn, meaning creating a relationship between knowledge and competence development. Mm -hmm. It's no longer enough just to learn to get knowledge but we have a much stronger focus on how we can use it in practice, also how we can use it in workplaces. Well, now, Ponce, you're much nearer the learning experience than we are. Um, can you identify with what he has said? And has your learning uh, taught you what learning was actually about? Well, hello. Firstly, I beg to differ. I'm not closer to learning than anybody else. I believe we're all lifelong learners. Every day we, we keep on learning. I fell into that one. <laughs> I fell into that trap. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But um, the question was... Well, the question was, uh, your own experience of learning, um, have you learned to be? Have you learned, I mean, the, the list of, of UNESCO targets, um, what, what do you feel learning is about? I think I, I have, being a wise learner like my other fellow learners, we, we all have come to a point where we've uh, uh, sort of touched on all those four pillars. But the, the question, I guess, would be where did I get that sort of education? Was it inside the classroom or was it more of outside the classroom, I guess, in, in our cases, which I feel, of course, is a combination of both. But in the other aspects that I, I hope to contribute on, in addition to the four pillars, would be um, learning to create, I think was more of an experience outside the classroom because we weren't given more opportunities to create in the classroom. Monique, what, 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 what is the philosopher's answer to what is learning for? Learning is for having a future. There is no future without learning, without education. And I, I think it's, uh, it's true at the individual and at the collective level. Because, um, you know, first, learning and education are at the, at the root of uh, economic growth. Uh, first, because uh, it's a condition for further technological innovations, but at the same time, learning and education can train, can train people properly and adequately for, uh, uh, for these people to have a real role in, uh, in, the, socio, in the society to, to come. I, I think we are doing now so, something which has never been done before in human history. We are teaching and educating um, students who will be alive at the end of the 21st century. Um, some of them will, will, uh, will live a very long time and uh, they will be um, working and living in a world we don't know that much about. So mm. we are teaching and educating people without knowing what kind of uh, uh, opportunity they will have, what kind of uh, world they have to confront probably a world of uh, scarce resources and a world of uh, environmental threats. And uh, in this condition, it seems to me that the most important thing we have to do, uh, taking, being aware of the fact that we are in a world of change and constant innovation, we have to equip uh, children with an intellectual framework which could be a real help for adapting for dealing with complex situation. Uh, now, of course, we have to impart knowledge and competencies, but at the same time, we have to train minds, uh, people to be able to, uh, so that people will be able to re react to a very complex world. I think it's very important. And I will add that we are living in a world of um, deeply rooted identities. Of course, human beings can live without identity of some sort. We know that. But at the same time, we have to live together in this world to come. So we need to be aware, and uh, that's a very important thing to teach children. We need to be aware that we, we share common values. We share common commitment beyond cultural belongings. But at the same time, it is true that one of the things education can do now is to teach children to abstract in a way, to detach themselves from the particular space or particular time they belong to. Uh, it's a very, there is a very concrete application to that. Uh, make children understand the necessity of some kind of environmental concern. They have to put themselves in an intellectual position of someone, of someone living 30 years, 40 years after us and we will, con we will be in a position to contemplate the world we have been, uh, we have been uh, left uh, after us. So it's very important for children to be able to enlarge, enlarge their minds and to be able to endorse the perspec other people's perspective and, uh, of course, uh, other temporal, to actualize to different temporal times. And, of course, um, it was often stressed that education has to be envisaged as uh, a kind of long, long life process. Mm. But f for this long life process to be possible, basic, edu basic education is very important. He has to provide a kind of, of block 
which uh, keeps alive not only the capacity for further learning, but the desire mm. to learn, to, to keep on learning. That's very important now. I, I'm really taken with your answer because you are really futuristic, looking forward all the time to the way in which the world is going to change for this generation. And yet my generation was actually uh, trying to learn from the past. We were trying to find out what it was like to be around in Shakespeare's time um, and, and identify with some of the characters. Uh, well, that now seems to be a bit of a waste of time. What, what I'm wondering from you, Sir Fazl, is whether you feel that the rest of the panel are in a rather luxurious position to make choices about quite what education is about, because what you're about is producing any education at all. Absolutely. When you are in a country where less than 50% of the population is illiterate, you are trying to get um, your large numbers of children who are out of school into school. So basically providing access to education and then trying to provide a quality education so I remember when I started um, our program in Bangladesh, um, I uh, wanted the various people in, in leading position in Bangladesh, politicians, social workers, writers, poets, artists, to come and advise me as to how to develop curriculum for poorest children. And we had a number of meetings. One, one artist, I remember, he said that you must teach children how to draw and how to paint. Uh, then they will uh, develop observational skills and, and so on. So I said that, you know, the poorest children won't have um, pencils and crayons and, and, and lots of papers to practice painting because our budget was $20 per child per year and we couldn't afford all this. So he said then, then he um, quietened down a bit and then said, well, what you could teach is get teachers to tell them to observe how a frog jumps into a pond and then come and draw it next day. So, so you don't always have to use pencils and crayons and papers to teach observation, you can teach it from nature. Mm. So like that, we we'd have developed our curriculum and materials and methods in such a way that it costs as little as possible and it provides a quality education for the children that we try to get into our schools. So, so basically we use women, housewives in villages who, are, who have got 10 to 12 years of education. We give them two weeks of training initially. Then we provide one day training every month and try to upgrade their skills as they go on teaching. So like that, we are providing a fairly quality, uh, high quality education to poorest children and they complete four years of primary education, which in our national system, they complete in five years. And we tend to do better than, than the state system mm. in the annual uh, examination that our children take at the end of five years of primary education. And of course, you have a huge advantage because you're teaching mainly girls and they are easier. There's, there's also another, another, another problem. We had <laughs> the true? girls it, were it neglected true, in our society. <laughs> And we, we insisted that at least 60% of the children must be girls when we set up a school. So this was one of the things that we have also tried to... So as a result of which, in Bangladesh today, we have got more girls in primary schools than boys. Hmm. So this has never happened in South Asia before and this has happened in Bangladesh in the last few years. So that's one area that uh, I think uh, was but very important. Let, let me pause you there because, Paul, sir, you wanted to come in. Um, I was just wondering that maybe an, an aspect of educating for our times in that context would be educating for a time where inequality exists in, in many ways. In one aspect that Dr. Carlsen pointed out, one pillar, um, learning to live together means, means learning to live together in a world where inequality exists. And those who have access to education would want to help others who do not. Mm. Well, I mean, that is absolutely the hope. I don't know to what extent you have any difficulty persuading somebody of 10 or 12 years education who hasn't sought to be a teacher to be a teacher. I mean, that's what you have to do, isn't it? You go into the community, you find one person who's educated, but who doesn't necessarily want to be a teacher, and you get them to be a teacher. Well, we are have, right now we are facing quite a lot of problems in South Sudan. South Sudan has just become independent. 
so, so it was part of Sudan and the, the, most of the people, most of the uh, teaching took place in Arabic. Mm. Now South Sudan has decided to teach in, in English. So they have changed the language. So the only, only teachers you can find in South Sudan now who, can, who are ready to teach in primary schools are um, teachers who were in camps either in Kenya or, uh, or Uganda uh, and who had some English education. Mm. So, so you, you have to basically are restricted to finding teachers from this community who, are, who have had some English. The other problem is, so, so if you want to expand South Sudan program in the sense that if you want to take all the children to school, then you have to, I suppose, import yeah. some teachers from Kenya and Uganda to be able to uh, teach for the next generation, once one generation has gone through, then of course it will be yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, well, now, uh, when we ask this question online, um, this question of what is learning actually for, um, we, we took a poll and um, we asked the question, I think it's going to come up right now, um, it is really learning for preparing learners for job markets and that's the major goal of, of education. Have we got that up there? Yeah, we have. Preparing learners for job markets is the major goal of education. And 44% disagreed, 39% agreed, and 17% neither agreed nor disagreed. That's rather interesting, is it not? Because it suggests people do not think, actually, uh, in a majority, that learning is about getting a job. It, would that be right, Arnie? I mean, a lot of people, if you ask them in the street, uh, what's, what's the learning really for? It was just to enable me to get a job. Hmm. I think most governments today would think that it's very important to have an education system that uh, develops skills and competences that uh, matches the needs at, uh, in the labor market, as we also just uh, heard in the presentation by Andreas Leicher from the OECD. But it is... Uh, it is also clear that most people think that education and learning is very much related to their positioning themselves, to fulfilling their human potential, uh, increasing their uh, capability of living in society, relating to other people. And in fact, for very many people, the moral values that are transferred in education are very important. Values like peace, democracy, tolerance, intercultural understanding, gender equity, and so on. Uh, but I would say the title of our session here is a new collaborative deal for education. And the new deal, that was a term forged in the 1930s in the United States of America. It was a response to a big depression in the economy. So I was asking myself when coming here, uh, is this the title because we now have a, de a de deep uh, or a big depression in education and we now need to develop a new deal to respond to this crisis or depression. And uh, it is evident if we look to the achievement of the education for all go goals that many countries will not achieve. Some countries will, others will not. And it is evident that we could speak about crisis, depression, mm -hmm. in uh, relation to the EFA goals. So a deal has some partners or some stakeholders. And I would say that a new deal would imply stakeholders like the learners, like uh, the world of work, of course the education, sector governments, the institutions, but also entities like the learning cities, because much of educational policy that could be formulated as a response uh, to, uh, uh, to um, the not achieving of many education systems, uh, maybe could be taken up at the municipality level in the form of learning cities or learning rural uh, districts and so on. So I think the stakeholders in a new deal are very different from the stakeholders in the old deal. The, the word collaboration is, is, is a very highly charged one because of course one, one of the difficulties is that 
globally, the inequalities in access to education are absolutely massive, but they're also massive inside nation states. And um, I mean, I'm on dangerous territory here, Monique, because you come from what I think we would call quite an elitist uh, circumstance. And the question I would ask you is whether it's realistic to think that people who have struggled to get into your now vast research institute, um, they've had to work extremely hard and rest of it, are they really going to be interested now in having to devote some proportion of their time to collaborating with people who are not having the same uh, opportunities? Now, there has been this program in Western Europe called Teach First, which is also being rolled out in India, um, which does get graduates straight into teaching without teacher training and the rest of it. But it's minuscule by comparison with the need. D am, am I asking you a question that you feel you can answer? I think what, you're, what you are saying is a necessity, you know. Uh, this elite institution which exists uh, in several parts of the world are not institution uh, as such, they are institution for certain kind of values. And the main, uh, uh, the main thing is to protect these values and to open them up, you know, to make more and more people have access to them. That's the point, you know, it's not an institutional form we are preserving, it's some kind of a uh, high, uh, high level education and we'd like very much that um, many more pe students could benefit uh, of them. But aren't but, the pressures moving the other way? I mean, for example, student fees in some countries are now getting so high that a lot of people who might have gone to university are thinking of not going to university. So, in fact, the squeeze is going in the opposite direction. Oh, yes, that's a big issue. That's not the question in France because uh, higher education is free, but uh, without any kind of fee. But at the same time, France managed to develop some kind of uh, oligarchic system too, which is very far from uh, the democratization of higher education, for example, to take this example that uh, it, uh, it aimed to at some time. Let's take an example. For, uh, 50 years ago in France, I, I just take the, the, this, uh, this case because really it's a case in point. Uh, only 5% of a generation uh, uh, had access to uh, had the baccalaureate, which was uh, the way of being admitted to a uh, university as higher education. Uh, 50 years later, there are 70 percent to have access to universities. Uh, so it's a very good record. We may say uh, 14, ta 14 times more people are, are just uh, get getting in universities. But does it mean that there are 40 times more students who have the benefit of a very good education? I wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. So something uh, turned wrong somewhere. First, uh, the, of, there were many more students, but the, the, the staff and the amount of money devoted to university di, di, was not raised the, the same way. And in the same time, you know, in this very so-called democratic system, this kind of system uh, managed to develop some kind of uh, elite tracks which are very close to everyone else. So in the outcome, it was not, uh, it was not a very good result. I, I want to, to take this example because it shows that uh, democratization and uh, egalitarianism doesn't mean necessarily equity. Mm -hmm. So the, the best way to cope with that and to deal with that kind of problem is to start very early on, you know, at primary school, because that's the way, and that's the time uh, at which uh, the main inequalities in uh, access to uh, good education are, are devised. And then uh, to be very careful about the fact that to help students at the individual basis to go as far as they can go, you know, given their, uh, their motivations, given their, uh, their talents, and to uh, provide for bridges, because some mm. students want to be very good at school a little later than others. Yeah. And uh, all kinds of, uh, of academic decisions are taken too early in life, <coughs> and the time for life in, in, uh, at which these decisions decision, uh, open opportunity for students are not the same for all students. Right. So bridges, uh, the possibility of going as far as uh, each student can go, and a, a, a very strong concern for prim primary education. Right. Well, uh, before we just go out to the audience, which we will do in the next uh, question, I just want to ask you one final question right now, Fazel. Looking at the educational world from where you are, morally, 
Who should be delivering um, this great change in education we're looking for? Is it the NGO sector? Is it the state? Is it the private sector? Who do you look to when you're well, where I, you are? Well, I think um, it's the state's responsibility to provide education and it should be the state provision should include everybody. Um, and I think right now there is a lot of um, debate about whether private sector to get into education and provide education, but it's to, to provide education with equity in the sense that every child has, an, has an access to education, a quality education, it should be a state's responsibility and that usually where state is very active in providing education, the citizens do well. Anyone disagree? Good, we've laid a benchmark then. The <laughs> state, the state is in charge when it comes to delivery. I see you shaking your head. The, the state gives the guidelines, but I, uh, I do believe in individual responsibilities and uh, the responsibility of communities. You know, the institution the, and different uh, individual initiatives or social initiatives ca can help with a kind of state gi giving uh, broad directions. Arne? Sorry? I, I think the uh, future we want in relation to education is moving from education for all to lifelong learning for all. And uh, lifelong learning for all involves also other stakeholders. So the education sector will have, I think, to reach the hand out to other sectors and collaborate with them. There's so much learning going on in the health sector, in, uh, in the world of work, etc. And I don't think we can only, in the future, uh, consider learning that happens in the formal education system. We need to have a holistic approach, I think, that also integrates the non-formal learning that happens in workplaces, in non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, and also all the learning that happens in the family when you go to the library, borrow a book and, uh, and uh, read it. I don't think any or maybe very few countries in the future will be able to afford to pay a formal, develop a formal education system that can cater for all the learning needs of society. Okay, I think the consensus then is that the state is in charge of setting it all up and regulating it, but that the many other resources will have to be drawn upon to deliver it. Um, right, we've got questions from the audience. We've got microphones everywhere, so there's no excuse not to be able to get heard. Um, let me look around and see what hands are up. Uh, anybody want to take this? Yeah, in the turquoise in the middle there, please, which would be number four, I think, probably. Uh, right in the middle of your first row there, uh, just behind the technicians. The, in turquoise, down the front here in the middle. Oh, well, then we'll, is this lady here with the turquoise? Uh, maybe I've got the color wrong, green. While well, I'm learning. And let's see, uh, other questions? Uh, if you keep your hand up in that row there, yep, you, then, the, then that microphone will get up there. Seven, could you go and reach the lady at the top there? Right, number four. Thank you very much. My name is Angela Little from the University of London. Um, if I may, I'd like to pose a question to Andreas Schleicher to take us back to that excellent presentation. Um, Andreas said that uh, how much um, countries spend on education explains no more than 20% of the variation in student achievement outcomes. Of all the other factors that Andreas mentioned in his presentation, which one explained more than 20% of the variation in achievement outcomes? And secondly, how much of the total variation in outcomes was explained by all of the factors that he looked at taken together? Thank you. A, a marvelously... Um Concise question. Uh, Andres, you happy to? Thank you very much. In fact, with our data on PISA, we can account today for about 80% of the performance variation of schools in the industrialized world. So data have become a very powerful predictor of what distinguishes higher and less well-performing education system. Volume of spending is about 20%. When you look at the spending choices that countries make, for example, you know, how they decide between paying teachers well or having long hours of instruction or buying wonderful facilities and so on, you can account a lot more than when you just look at the volume of spending. It's basically the kind of choices you make. And when you look at this on balance across countries, 
One of the things you see is that high-performing nations generally tend to prioritize the quality of teachers and teaching, spending that goes into quality of teaching over things like infrastructure, class size, and those kinds of factors. Thank you very much. Um, number two, let's uh, hear your question, please. And uh, well, then we'll come to num number one. My name is Yara Darwish, and I'm actually a wise learner um, from Qatar. And I have a question that I want to address to um, Dr. Monique. Like, I appreciate your optimism, and I see myself as an optimist as well. But you mentioned that you're dealing with deeply rooted identities. Um, how can you ensure that these strong identities, particularly cultural identities, are strengthened in a span of like 10 or 20 years, the ones you were talking about? Because it would be a shame to have diversity erode with the establishment of stronger globalized ties within the educational system. Monique? We, we, are, we are sharing a world, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, it imposes uh, requirements not only for the sharing of resources, but for the sharing of common understanding and mutual respect, too. We have to, to keep this world going, and I think the, the best way to do that is, is to uh, uh, make some progress in the way of understanding each other. And uh, uh, I, I was uh, insisting on the fact that uh, uh, common values and common commitments were very important. It doesn't mean that these values are defined if, uh, somewhere and has to be uh, imposed elsewhere. But at, uh, I think it's very important that th these values must be focused on the de development of human intelligence and human being. Uh, it was said uh, at the beginning of the discussion that education was made for empowerment. I do believe in the notion of empowerment of individuals in, 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 in a collectivity and in a society. And each society, each culture, reach that ideal in a different way. But uh, somehow there are common features in that, uh, giving uh, individual uh, a liberty of choice, uh, uh, giving individual the possibility of defining uh, himself or herself. And uh, I think that uh, if we give so much uh, uh, importance to education is because of that, because we want uh, individuals who are able to understand the complexity of the, of the world, who are able to work for uh, keeping this world alive, whatever the, the threat and, and difficulties which are looming. And uh, because we, we, we think that, uh, in a way, uh, we, 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 have to, we are responsible for, uh, for the capacity given to each human being to, to develop itself at the, at the, a, 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 as much as he can in the kind of a specific situation he is born in. So uh, that, that was the reason. And I come back to some issue which was uh, brought up at the beginning of the discussion. Uh, we discussed on the importance of a, a general framing of the mind general intellectual quality that uh, every mind has to acquire to be to adapt to uh, the workplace and to be properly trained for the workplace even if we don't have any idea of the kind of work which is we uh, ask for him or for her uh, so and uh, at the same time with uh, the relation with our tradition and our past uh, versus our future is as if now we have to train children uh, with the prospect of uh, um, f having two minds in one. One mind for the general education and general intellectual quality, and one, one mind for the uh, specific knowledge, specific abilities, which are very important, especially in the te technological world we enter in. And at the same time, we have two minds, a mind for the past and traditions and all our belongings, and a mind for universality. And of course, with all that, we have to live harmoniously, mm -hmm. even if one mind challenges the other. But in the way, you know, when I was uh, thinking of that, I was, I was just uh, wondering, but was it not the case at the beginning of the Renaissance, at the, <laughs> at the end of the 15th century or the beginning of 16th century, they were discovering a new world, uh, all kind of uh, open possibilities before man, you know, as Descartes said uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, master of nature, 
of course, is not the ideal. We're entertained now. We have to be master of the world we have created uh, against nature in most cases. But still, let, let that question aside. But they were, in a way, from the past towards the future, and they were uh, from what they belong uh, for universality. Well, uh, we have the same agenda. Lovely. I'm now going to take a few questions at once because otherwise we won't get to the full flavor of the questioning that's going on. So number one here, but I see the hand here, if anybody is able to reach this. If you could keep your hand up, it's coming to you now. Yeah, come down and keep your hand up. That's it, right. So these two questions next, please, and then number three. So we'll take three questions and see if we can make sense of them. One. Hello. Is, is this it's on? good. You're on. Hello. Yep. I'm Sonia Darlington. I teach at a small liberal arts college in Beloit, Wisconsin. And my question deals with the paradoxical goals that education has. How do we pursue creative innovation in education and simultaneously encourage a stability that allows us to do more than prize the clinical observation of death? And here I mean thousands of biological organisms, as in seeds, languages as in terms of African languages, and cultures such as in neighborhood schools? Hmm, interesting, interesting question. Let, let, let's take uh, this one here, please, which is number two. Hello, I'm Monty Kasim from Ritsumeikang University in Japan. Uh, my question can be answered by anyone from the panel. How do you see the balance between hard work and fun in learning. And I ask this particularly because some of the newer pedagogic tools appear to be more fun than hard work. And secondly, the balance between reverence and irreverence. Uh, I find that some of the most creative work from my laboratory has come from an irrever irreverent question. Thank you. Really lovely question, fantastic. And uh, the, the, the number three. Good evening, I'm Oscar Becerra from Peru in South America. In my country, uh, an evaluation of teachers showed that less than 2% could perform basic arithmetic operation of teachers, and uh, more than 60% couldn't understand what they read. What can be done with such, a, such quality of teachers when you cannot change that in the short term? That is a huge challenge, and, and, and in a way, um, I'll come to you in a moment on it and, and, and see whether we can make sense of it. I'm going to ask you first. I loved the idea of this uh, balance between reverence and irreverence, and the balance between hard work and fun. Did you find it? What do you mean by irreverence? Irreverence, I mean actually, you know, possibly saying, hang on a minute. I mean, challenging in a, in a very... Um, creative way, perhaps, and, and in a way which doesn't necessarily um, honor the uh, quality of the question. You mean... You know what reverence is, <laughs> don't you? Reverence is obviously... Yes, yes. Yeah, but irreverence is exactly the opposite of that. And um, how do we design education to cope with no, reverence what, what, and irreverence? What I wondered was whether, in your educational experience, uh, you had found the balance between reverence and here, no, hell, irreverence. And whether you'd found the balance between hard work and fun. Okay, I'll answer Did the hard work fun? and fun first. It's easier to understand the question. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I have to ask the philosopher. You better yeah. carry on, yeah. You, hard work and fun. Um, I think it's not a question of either or. It, I, I would prefer to, have, to, to work hard and have fun doing it. Um, with wise learners, we work a lot, but we, we find fun and fulfillment in it. I, it shouldn't be a choice, I, I think. But in the Philippines, before you got to wise, did, it, did, did you manage to, to have fun learning? I think that's the reason why my colleagues and I at school at the time co-founded what we did, uh, working with NGOs. It's, it's because we didn't find fulfillment in what we did. We have, fa we have passion in... in business in, in marketing, but we wanted to find meaning and fulfillment in it, so we decided to use it to, to work with NGOs. Arne, did you um, find anything in the question about creativity and the clinical obs obsession of, with death? Which I thought was rather an interesting question, but I couldn't see how to answer it. 
Uh, the, 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 down here at number one, she asked us an interesting question about um, creativity, the, the, this, the tension between creativity and the clinical observation of death in seeds. And I think the question of uh, creativity also is related to the question about distinguishing between relevant and irrelevant learning. And uh, we can establish educational programs with a lot of relevant learning, but in fact what is also requested from the workplace is work skills in relation to negotiating, in, uh, to uh, uh, multitasking, to cooperating with others, and also to be able to have a very nice culturally based communication with people. So it's also very relevant, even for an engineer or for a medical doctor, to learn about la Renaissance or to learn about Shakespeare. So I think the question about how you develop creativity uh, with the help or based on an educational program is related to the distinguish, to distinguish between relevant and irrelevant learning. But very often, in fact, we will find that what from the first uh, phase would look as irrelevant mm -hmm. is what in the end will be considered to be the most relevant learning of all. So this has to be really investigated what is relevant and irrelevant and how do we create creativity. But it's, uh, it's evident creativity has something to do with the fulfillment of the uh, personal human uh, potential uh, just as much as the content or subject uh, in, in a school. So Faisal, clearly the questioner from Peru is further down the line than your projects are. They've reached a point of frustration. Now, you may well reach that same point of frustration because you may not have good enough teachers coming up the line to take over uh, when these kids start getting to a, a much more developed stage. So, w what's your answer to him? Well, that's, that's indeed the problem that we, we, we find that once our children get out of primary schools, they go to a secondary school which is <laughs> even worse. Mm. And so, so, what I've been trying to do in Bangladesh at least is to try to get secondary school teachers training going as a separate project to try and improve quality of education in secondary schools. You've added East, so, Afri so you, you've added East Africa. Could you add uh, Latin America as well then to your project? Could you yeah, pop, pop down there and start a, a teacher training program? Of course, <laughs> of course. But, but, but this is a special project that we have taken up. Some Out of 18,000 secondary schools, we have taken up 3,000 to try and improve quality. And we are trying out not only teacher's training, but also mentoring and other uh, uh, ways of uh, improving quality teaching learning in these schools. We only have a few minutes left, and uh, in fact under five, so I'm going to take one more cluster of questions. Uh, any, any, there's a question right in the middle of the, front of the third row back here, and any other questions while, while I'm there? Um, yes, number one. Let's take you number one while somebody's getting a, a microphone. Um, well, I suppose as you're there, I'll take you three. I, I'm sorry to distress you, but I can't take you. Right. One and three, and then I think we're going to have to have to call it a day. One. Yes, questioner, that number one. Um, my question is to um, Sir Fazel. Okay, so I was just a little frustrated and disturbed about your um, comment about... Um, education being the responsibility of the state, I would be very glad if you could probably elaborate more on that because as a wise learner I have been very motivated and empowered to try and make a change in my country um, when it comes to education. So what do you think my role is as an, in, as an individual if the responsibility of education is for the state and how can we co collaborate with the state for that matter to um, provoke some kind of change. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll just take this questioner three. I'm Caroline Anyanweva. I work with Arne at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. The theme of this session is educating for our times. And since this morning, we have heard about the importance of the teachers. And again, we heard from OECD how teachers are key for quality education. But on the other hand, we know that the status of teachers all over the world are declining. Teachers are getting low and lower salaries. That's why in my country, in the Philippines, teachers are living in droves to work overseas. So my question is to Sir Hassan. 
how do you keep teachers motivated, given that they have low status, they're not having good training opportunities. What is your strategy for poor countries? Because we've been hearing about countries like Singapore, Finland, Japan, with high expenditures in education. But what are countries like Bangladesh going to do so that you are ensuring, we are ensuring, that teachers who are key to quality education are really going to be able to deliver quality education? Well, you've got two questions to answer. Well, uh, well in the, indeed. Um, I think um, the reason I said that the state has got the primary responsibility for primary and secondary education is because of equity in the sense that many ch uh, children uh, are now deprived from primary education because they can't uh, access secondary schools, for primary and secondary schools. So access to children is absolutely essential. There, and there, there's the other question of private schools providing uh, quality education at a cost and of course they can be afforded only by well-to-do people, families. So I'm saying that although these, are pro these provisions are there, they should continue but then so state what, should what try you, and provide… What do you tell her to do then? I mean, uh, Sorry? She, she wants to play a role in Ghana in changing the educational system. system. And she says, well, if it's the state, what, how am I going to collaborate? Well, this is exactly what, what when I started um, education in primary education in Bangladesh, one of the uh, objective of my program was and to scale up the program was to try and change the governmental system in such a way that they, pro they also provide a quality education. But unfortunately, I haven't been very successful <laughs> yet, but then I, we still continue to work with the government and try and improve the quality of education. And, and let, let me butt in and very briefly ask you to move on to the other question, which is how do you retain a good, good how, teacher? How do you yeah. motivate teachers? Yeah. How do you, how you retain them? I mean, they're, they're losing them overseas to other well, people. Well, as, as we, we uh, provide education to poorest children, so we, we really can't spend a lot of money in per child per year. Uh, we, our cost is about $34 per child per year. We try and take teachers in the villages in which we set up a school. And in the village, if there is a housewife with 10 to 12 years of education, uh, we, we, we normally have three to four candidates for teachers' job. We provide them uh, training for initially for two weeks and then every month one day refresher course and continuous supervision of their classes twice a week and provide uh, uh, supportive supervision to try and improve their skills. So what they get at the end of it is that a satisfaction of teaching a group of children from their own village that keeps them motivated. Their status in the whole village goes up so that also keeps them motivated. So we find the teachers are uh, quite well satisfied with the kind of work they do and the kind of supportive supervision break provides to them. And continuously uh, we try to improve their skills so that they can go to higher classes and as the children go to higher classes, they also teach at a better, at a higher class level mm -hmm. and ultimately become a very good, good high quality teacher. So we actually have been very, very well satisfied with the teacher's motivation as well as their performance in our school system. So, so uh, I, I have, we have not found any real problems in creating incentives for teachers to, to do the, their best Th in our system. Thank you very much and thank you for some terrific questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to each of them, but I'll try and call you in my next session. Um, but uh, a really stimulating um, period now, it really started um, by Andrew Schleicher uh, with a really fabulous uh, range across the way education is changing and the way we can change it. Uh, and then the, the panel here, I personally thought that uh, Dr. Kanto Spera's uh, vision of having students come into one's um, uh, responsibility, whose future we have no way of knowing, this idea they could live for a hundred years and we have no idea of what will happen in those hundred years. I suppose in the end that if we visited teachers in the 18th century, we'd find them saying the same thing. But will it, would it be as drastic as we feel it to be now because of the fantastic pace of technology? 
Anyway, enormous challenges, and we've ranged across a lot, and I think left a whole lot of balloons in the air that we can uh, chase and um, pursue in these uh, coming hours and the, the next two days. But on your behalf, I'd like to thank Dr. Arne Carlson, uh, Safaza Hassan Abed, uh, Dr. Monique uh, Cantos Berber, and Ponce Ernest San Diego, and above all, you for being um, a terrific extension of the WISE experience. Thank you very much indeed. No, my dear chap, I didn't put it very well. <laughs>